Hello and welcome to episode one of Debates in Geomorphology, brought to you by the British Society for Geomorphology and the Serious Geogains Lab. My name is Chris Skinner and I am the Vice Chair of the Outreach and Education Committee for the British Society of Geomorphology. Now in this video we're going to be discussing some of the most um, highly debated issues in the science of geomorphology as it is today. Um, each of one of these debates has been proposed and contributed to by members of the society and geomorphologists around the world. So before we start, I just want to describe to you what geomorphology is, especially if it's a term you've never come across before. In school, you're most likely to have encountered uh, geomorphology in geography lessons, particularly physical geography. It's the science of how landscapes form, how they change and how they develop. It tells us the story of how the Earth's surface got to look like how it does today and helps us understand how it might change in the future. Where geology tells us how tectonic plates collide and frost up new mountain ranges, it is here where geomorphology begins its long journey of weathering those mountains down. It is the processes of water, wind and ice that erode those mountains. The glaciers that slowly grind away at the rock to form huge U-shaped valleys carrying the boulders it is plucked out of the ground and those that have fallen onto it by rockfalls and landslides. It is at the end of these glaciers and where they retreat that they drop their cargo and leave behind piles of rocks. Here the rivers take over. Rain or melting snow and ice swell into strong flows able to pick up or roll these rocks into it in its path. As they tumble, they are ground down into smaller and smaller fragments, stones to pebbles to individual grains of sand. The river is constantly changing, shaping and reshaping its valley. As it flows, it forms winding paths as it meanders over the floodplain that contains the memories of itself from years gone by, always seeking that straighter path and leaving behind lonely and forgotten oxbow lakes. Our rock from the mountains is now sand as it enters the tempestuous estuary where the river and the tides jewel over the sand and mud, constantly reforming the underwater bed. Eventually our sand grain will make it to the sea, but its story doesn't quite end yet as below the sea, in another world of geomorphology mirroring that on the land, with its own channels and landslides and fields of dunes. One day that sand grain may settle and become buried, and crushed under the weight of a millennia of deposits, it will one day leave the world of geomorphology and rejoin the world of geology. Around the world's coasts, the waves of our stormy seas are shaping the boundary between the land and the water, forming beaches and eroding cliffs. In the deserts, it is the wind that shifts the landscapes, whipping up fine sands into migrating fields of dunes. Geomorphology is now taking us to different worlds, as spacecraft provide us eyes on other planetary surfaces, and we try to understand what forms the rocky and icy landscapes of the Moon, Mars or Pluto. Geomorphology is the science of the big, of mountains and rivers and ocean floors. It is also the science of the small, of sand grains and how they are picked up by water and wind. It is the science of the ages, of landscapes forced upwards and then eroded back down over millions of years, and it's the science of the now, of hillslides suddenly collapsing and rivers bursting their banks. It is a science of the past, of how landscapes got to be how they are, and a science of the future, predicting how they will continue to change. As the morphology in the name suggests, geomorphology is a science about change. It is dynamic, and just as our earth keeps changing, so does our understanding of it. There are still many things we just don't know or understand fully enough yet. And it is likely that there are things that we think we understand, but somewhere down the line, something will surprise us and make us think differently. There are things that as a group of scientists, researchers, practitioners and enthusiasts, we're still very much divided on. I open this up to the geomorphology community on Twitter, asking them for their thoughts on what these big debates are. Many of the suggestions were based around processes. This suggestion by Steve Brace strikes at the heart of our understanding of how landscapes are formed. It takes a very, very long time for something like a river valley to develop, and often we think that this happens because of lots of really, really small, ch small changes that happen all the time, 
and these gradually build up to form the river valley. However, we also know that some landscapes um, where almost nothing happens at all for most of the time, and then suddenly one big event, like a storm, causes a huge amount of change in a really, really short space of time. Continuing the landscape evolution theme, others suggested that the debate is about what are the most important things for developing landscapes? What are these large-scale processes that drive that? Are they tectonics or climate? This is a contentious issue, and a lot of people weighed in, suggesting other things that are drivers for, main drivers for landscape change. Animals and the influence that they have on the landscape was thrown into the mix. But can animals really have the same influence as tectonics and climate on how our landscapes are shaped? As this discussion developed, as well as about animals, plants were thrown in as something which can help form our landscapes. It was also suggested that there's a feedback and our landscapes and their shapes might also influence the biology in the plants and the animals that live in those landscapes. Some took it right back to the beginning. How do our landscapes start developing in the first place? For example, does water flow naturally form a river that then develops into a valley? Or does it need some kind of proto-valley, something there in the first place to exist for the river to form? This is really a geomorphological chicken and egg situation. And following on from this, it was asked at what scales we need to look at to understand how landscapes form, especially considering that these changes occur over large areas and very long times, yet they're driven by processes and events that are much smaller and a lot quicker. And even if we answered these questions for landscapes on Earth, how can we use this knowledge to better understand landscapes on Earth other planetary bodies. Our process and physical laws as we know them for Earth, uh, for Earth, are they applicable when we're trying to understand, for example, how channels might form on Mars? Would a Martian river behave the same way as a terrestrial one? And then there were those who looked closer to home and questioned to what extent our actions as humans, as a society, are affecting geomorphology. With us moving into the geological era of the Anthropocene, humans are the dominant influence on the environment. Are we a geomorphological agent? For example, how much of the sediment in our rivers today is there naturally, and how much is there because of the way we farm is causing erosion of soil? At a continental scale, is it possible that this soil erosion is actually changing the visibility of an entire sea? Relating directly to my own research, as rivers change, so does the likelihood of them flooding, and also the severity of the flooding when it does happen. But can we use geomorphology to our advantage to reduce the chances and damages of flooding? At the global level, through our use of fossil fuels in the emission of greenhouse gases, our actions are changing the climate, and this is changing um, the nature and the extent that we get rainfall. And this is inevitably going to have an impact on landscapes, both in the short and long term. But what exactly will those impacts be? So how do we adapt to these future changes? Do we have to start thinking now about how we're going to manage future changes to keep people and properties safe? For example, if an increase in rainfall causes rivers to change more frequently and more dramatically, do we need to start moving towns and cities away from rivers? to give that river more space to move. And finally, are the changes we have wrought and will continue to make mean that the way landscapes change is so fundamentally different that looking at to the past and how landscapes have changed previously is no longer useful for our understanding of how they will change in the future. So having watched the discussions evolve over the last week, I think we have four themes that we can turn into debates. 1. How do our landscapes change? How do the processes of landscape formation get started? Do they change through small and often events, or large and rare ones? Is that the same everywhere? And how does it vary around the world? 2. What are the main drivers for landscape change? What processes dictate how our landscapes look? Is it tectonics, or is it climate? What role do plants and animals have on shaping landscapes? And how does this change when we look at different scales? 3. 
How does our understanding of landscapes on Earth help us understand landscapes on other planetary surfaces? Did Mars once have water? Would glaciers and rivers behave in a similar way on Mars as they do on Earth? What formed the landscape of the Moon? And is the surface of Pluto too different to anything on Earth to make any sort of analogy? And four, what is the impact of geomorphology on society and what is the impact of society on geomorphology? What are the feedbacks? Where is geomorphology driving some of the main issues facing society today? And how could we use geomorphology to address some of those? So over the next eight weeks, we'll be conducting these debates on Twitter and putting them together into short videos like this one to share online. Please keep your eye on the BSG Twitter, its YouTube and the website for more news and updates. Thank you for watching.